something handy. Uh, if you'll get it out, we'll go over the things coming up. And first thing, right out of the gate, we need to make a change. Um, in uh, it says Saturday, June 24th. That's next Saturday. It's work day. Scratch that out. We're going to move work day to July 1st and July the 8th. Um, the reason for it, and I know it's a holiday weekend. If you're not going to be in town, that's fine. But if you're going to be in town, you can help us uh, the 1st and the 8th. Reason for that, Aaron's open house is next Saturday from 3 to 5.30. My understanding is they're going to be doing some decorating uh, Friday night, so I don't want to go in there and trash up the building. We're going to try to maybe redo where the uh, door's going in. That would make a big mess. So July 1st and July 8th, we'll be working on probably putting up Vacation Bible School stuff because Vacation Bible School starts on the 9th. So uh, that's on a Sunday night. Uh, be Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Yes. Uh, no, uh, Sandra has got some stuff that we're going to use, but it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, the registration forms are on that table right back there um, outside of where we lock Chris up. It's right there. If, if you want to get those, it would help us a lot if you do pre-registration so that on uh, Sunday night we don't have a massive amount of people trying to get reg registered. So if you want to sign up your kids and grandkids and all that, pick up the registration form. There's two parts to that. There's the personal information, contact information if there's an issue. And then there's also a permission form because we do take pictures and we do uh, put those on Facebook and stuff, so we need your permission to do that. If you don't want us to do it, just make sure you let us know. All right. So, and again, obviously, Vacation Bible School is coming up uh, Sunday through Thursday. And by the way, uh, we will be providing meals for the workers, for the workers and their families, okay? Not the attendees, but the workers and their families. That will be on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. We're not going to do that on Sunday night, but Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, uh, during the work week, we will be providing meals for that. And maybe getting with some of you, uh, I, Joan and I is going to do the, like the main thing, it's going to be kind of a barbecue theme all week. We're going to do pulled pork one night, hot dogs one night, hamburgers one night, and then the last night will be uh, leftovers so we can clean up everything. Uh, but we might be getting with some of you to provide uh, some signs for that. All right, um, family day then is the 25th of this month. You know this, the routine for that. Work day next month, 22nd, 23rd. I, Let's take it a day at a time. We're not even going to worry about that. <laughs> uh, building update. The electrician started work again uh, this last week, um, roughing in some of the, of the wiring. He, now, he can't do everything because part of it, we have to have the drywall in, uh, but he'll do everything that he can do uh, probably in the next week or two uh, as far as the roughing in the wiring. I, financially, I'm not sure where we're at because we spent some money for at an auction for some stuff and the, the truck to go get it and all that. I, I think after we pay the electrician, we might have four or five thousand left. I don't know, but the next biggie will be the HVAC. That's going to be twelve thousand dollars. So uh, be praying about that, and if the Lord would lead you to give, do just make sure you mark it on the envelope for that particular project. All right, I think that that will do for announcements. Dan's going to come and lead us in a song. Let's stand together, Christmas, page 65.
praise you this morning for the awesome and only true God that you are. Lord, you're wonderful. And we, we count it such a blessing, Lord, to have a relationship with you. And it's our sincere desire if there, anyone visits today that does not have that relationship, that you would help them to understand their condition, repent of their sin, turn to, to Christ in faith, Lord, that they might be reconciled to you. And again, for those of us that know you, Lord, we do pray that song that we just sang. Draw us nearer, we pray. And we'll thank you for it. Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, I'll turn it over to Landon. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles, James chapter 5. Going to be looking at verses 7 through 12 this morning. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 7, says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by another oath, but let your yes be a yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you once again. Father, we yield to you this morning. Father, I understand that I, I don't have the ability to bring your word that does it justice, Father. It has to be you. And we pray just now, Father, that you would open your word to us. That it would wash over our hearts, Father. That it wouldn't just uh, penetrate our minds to where we could agree and, and give mental assent to it. But, Father, it would actually affect our lives. And we pray just now, Father, that you would help quiet our hearts as we hear what your word has to say. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, in our study of James, James had just dealt with... Uh, in, in the previous verses, not letting your, your riches own you. As we discussed last week, we, we realized that it's not a bad thing to have money, but it is a bad thing for your money to have you. And we talked about last week about um, really all kinds of idol worship and replacing whatever God's place is in your heart and replacing that with anything, whether it's money, whether it's self, whether it's drug, whatever the case may be. But now James moves on into dealing with the patience as we wait on the Lord. Uh, those of you that have accepted Christ as your Savior, you will notice one thing, that when you did accept Christ as your Savior and you became part of His family, you didn't just get raptured out right away. It would be one thing that if, uh, if the whole goal was to, uh, was to be able to be saved and there was nothing left for you to do, then that would be what it would look like. You would get saved and then all of a sudden you'd be taken out of the world because you accomplished the goal. But that's not the whole goal. In fact, what he wants you to do is after you're saved, he wants you to grow in him and he wants you to tell others about him. And he moves on to dealing with, and that takes great patience. Many people would say that they're willing to die for God. Have you ever heard that? Well, I'm, I'm willing to die for God. If there were somebody that were to come in here this morning and they were to hold a gun to my head and, and, and I would be willing to lay down my life for, and, and not 
renounce my faith in God. But my question this morning is how many are willing to live for him? Because it would be easy for, I mean, not easy, but it would be one thing for us to say in a brief moment that I would be willing to sacrifice my life, and that is a big thing, but it is also a big thing that every single day you get up and you live for Him. And you give your life for Him. We may be willing to give our life, but are we willing to give our life in as we live to Him? James says in in verse 7, it says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. What you've got to realize, if we go back all of those weeks ago when we started this this, uh, study in James, he's talking about those that were in Jerusalem that were the dispersion, those that were taken from their homes, those that were fearful for their lives, and, and yet here he's saying, Be patient. Patient until the coming of the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said, Those who do not hope cannot wait. But if we hope for what for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. James says to be patient. Comes from a compound, uh, it comes from a compound word, macros meaning temper and Timos meaning long. The focus, uh, to focus on the final lap of the race, the idea is, is to set the timer of one's temper for a long run, endurance. Having a long fuse. James urges believers to maintain an attitude of patience while suffering injustice. They were suffering injustice, and you've got to re- realize that about them is the fact that it wasn't right for them to be dispersed from their homes. It wasn't justified in for them to be enduring the things that they, uh, that they were having to endure, but yet when James, under, uh, under, the, uh, uh, under the Holy Spirit, is writing to them, and he's telling them, be patient even in the injustices that are done to you. In our flesh, it's hard to see anything other than the injustice that's right in front of us. Have you ever had anybody that's done wrong by you? It's hard to see past that. Because in fact, in our flesh, what do we want want to see done? We want, and in fact, it's even in the, uh, the things, it's in the books that we read, the movies that we watch, we all like to see when somebody has injustice done to them, then eventually at some point throughout that time, we take comfort in knowing that that person that did the injustice is going to get what's coming to them. That's a movie that's been, that's a movie script that's been written time and time and time again. Watch any Clint Eastwood movie and it's always that. It's always that. The characters change, the name changes, but here's the thing is I can, I watch them every single time. Multiple times. We like that. And in our flesh, we like to see that the injustice that is done, that eventually it's going to be taken care of. And it is, in fact, eventually going to be taken care of, but it's just not by you. You are not Clint Eastwood. (laughs) In our flesh, it's hard to see anything past the injustice when somebody harms you, when somebody does wrong by you. And in our flesh, it's hard to see anything but that injustice right in front of us. Especially when that injustice is done to us. It's hard for us to, it's easy for us to look at this and agree that yes, we need to be patient. But it's hard for us to agree that we need to be patient when we're actively in the middle of suffering. Have you ever had somebody that's given you advice while you're going through something and you almost, and you know that they're coming from a good place, but you just don't want to hear it? I don't, I don't want to hear that right now. And what they're saying may be true, but you know what? I just, I just want to wallow a little bit. 
Or have you ever been that you're just in the mood and you want to you want to complain and you want to vent and then all of a sudden they're they're giving you these these churchy answers and you don't want to hear that at the moment. Especially when you're venting about somebody and then they start to talk about forgiveness, you don't want to hear that. And I'm sure that the people that were the direct recipients of James's letter would think that we were ready for this injustice to be done with us. We're ready for justice to prevail. And yet they, they received this letter and they're thinking that maybe James is going to give us instruction as to how we can overcome this. And yet here he is saying, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. We need to be patient when injustice is in front of us and especially when injustice is done to us. We need to be patient. I don't know uh, if you, I've, there's been a couple of guys that I've followed that I've, that have gotten into like ultra marathons that have done long distance running. I have not done that myself, obviously. But these, they do these ultra marathons, and an ultra marathon, what they do is they're usually about 100 miles, and sometimes they're in some of the most extreme conditions that you'll ever think of, and it's just crazy to listen to these guys and the things that they've got to prepare because they're not just going out there. It's not just a race in the sense that they're just running around a track and they've got to do this, but they've got to prepare for the weather. They've got to prepare for um, dehydration. They've got to prepare for all of these things. But one thing that they have to know is they have to be patient. They have to be patient. I don't know a whole lot about long distance running, but I do know that it's not how they start out. Doesn't because you, if you read about these races, you'll find out that there are there are tons of people that start out that are doing great. But then here's the thing: they've got a hundred miles to go, and they don't prepare for certain things. But there's many of them that they they look at these. Uh, what their track is going to be and where they're going to go and they try to get themselves mentally prepared for what's going to be happening at that moment. And many of them say the same things, many that have competed and many that have succeeded in that field and many will tell you the same things. They just focus one step at a time. One right after another. Keep going, keep going, keep on. Yes, they've had their prep time. They, they know how to deal with situations. But they say just one step at a time because you can't be worrying about mile 99 at mile 20. And though you've prepared for the mile 90 through 100 and the challenges that may pre- uh, present themselves... But you have enough to deal with at mile one, at mile two. And really, that's how life operates. In the race of life, we, we can carry that same philosophy that we can prepare for mile 90 through 100, but we don't allow it to take away our focus from right now. Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What is the paraphrase of that verse? Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. Stop focusing all of your energy on mile 99 when you're on mile 20. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. That's going to that's gonna be anxious about itself, but sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You've got enough to deal with today without thinking about next week or next year or five years or ten years down the road. Because here's the reality. We might not be here in ten years. So why are we worried about it? Sufficient for today. We have all, we all have enough troubles to handle today. And if we end up borrowing trouble for, from tomorrow, we end up running 100 miles an hour 
in place. Have you, ever, have you ever felt like that? You felt like you've got so much to do and there's certain people that they, can, they can't handle if there's multiple things that are coming in and, and you, you feel like you've got so much to do and you end up just running around in circles and trying to put out fires and trying to get all of this stuff accomplished and you're going 100 miles an hour but then at the end of the day you don't get anything accomplished because you didn't focus, on, focus in on the task at hand. We have enough trouble today to not worry about next week. Yeah, we can prepare. We can try to uh, prep as much as we can, but there's going to be things that were unforeseen. So we just take it one day at a time, one step at a time. Because what we'll find ourselves is we'll exert all of the energy, but not get anywhere. That's what worrying does. Is it takes all of your mental focus, it, it affects your relationships, it affects the way that you conduct yourselves, it, can, it, it affects the way that you witness to people. It affects all of these things, but it never gets you anywhere. Then James gives the example of the, what I believe is the epitome of patience, and that's the farmer. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. Any of you that have ever done a garden or anything like that, it is not for those who aren't patient. Farming is the very definition of hard work without instant gratification. If you've ever done a garden, if you've ever done any of these things, that's the epitome. You're out there and you're working hard and you're sweating and you're dirty and then at the end of the day, you still don't have anything. In fact, if, if the weather's not favorable or if you, if you can put in all the work above, but if you don't maintain that and continue to work hard, it's going to be for naught because you're not going to reap anything. What happens if you do all of the right things and you plant the garden and you don't tend the weeds? What happens? The weeds take over quick. That's the only thing that does grow fast is the weeds. They take over. And, and this is what, and this, that's, that's always been the same Thing. And, and the, the crazy thing about God's word is how he could take something that so many thousand of years ago and it can apply to us because we know the same that they know that when we're talking about patience, the perfect example of that is a farmer. They give everything they have to reap benefit in the future. The worst farmer in the world is an impatient one. And I would go as far to say that the worst Christian in the world is an impatient one. The worst soul winner in the world is an impatient one. If you try to reap the harvest too early, you end up back at square one. But also the farmer must complete each task in front of him that day each task in front of them that day. So when the, the, the farmer can't be thinking and preparing about the actual harvest until he gets the seed in the ground. And how good would it be for a farmer to sit up at night and, 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 and really think about and mentally go through, well, this is what the harvest is going to look like and this is what, the, what I expect the weather to be and this and this and this. And he just paced back and forth and he goes over it time and time and time and time again in his mind. And that does no good because after all, the seed's still ain't in the ground. And many of us, we live our lives like that as we walk and we pace back and forth and we mull over every single situation and every single thing that might or might not take place. And then at the, and, and, and we didn't take care of the troubles that we had for that day. The farmer must complete each task every single day. 
when we go out and we see the the corn or the bean fields and you see, and especially with the cornfields, you'll see these stalks and as they, you get to see the different, and if you drive the same ways, you'll get to see kind of the whole lifespan of, the, of that cornfield around here. But if you, when we go out and we see those great big stalks, and that's, res, that's representation of someone carrying out their day-to-day task for several months. We've got to stop allowing what we can't control to paralyze us for what we can do today. There are many people that they're, they are, they're so paralyzed by fear of what, what, what is going to come in the next election or what's going to happen with the economy that they, they just set themselves paralyzed in fear and they don't do anything that day. Just sit back and worry. We've got to stop allowing the future because the future is unclear. We have no idea what's going to happen. We have no idea if things are going to get better, if things are going to get worse, if it's going to all end. We have no idea. But what we do know is that God has given us the grace that we need for today to deal with the things that we need to deal with today. If we focus on borrowing trouble from tomorrow, we'll end up running 100 miles an hour in place and putting in a whole lot of effort but not getting anywhere. Verse 8 says, You also be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. New American Standard says, You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts. Verse 8 urges us to show patience and courage because of the nearness of Jesus' return. We should show a firm purpose and depend constantly on God's grace. Most of us in here this morning would say that we believe in the imminent return of Christ. And when I say imminent return of Christ, it means that it could happen at any point, any moment. And we believe that that to be true, but if that belief would move from our heads to our hearts, it would change our entire outlook on life and the things that we hold in such high regards. Why are we allowing things of next year to affect us today when we may not even be here? But most of us, to be real truthful, can't help ourselves but to worry. But worry doesn't resolve anything. But rather it makes us, it makes the here and now scarier than it is. You want to know how paranoia sets in? Most of the time, people that are paranoid about things, it's not about the things that are right in front of them. They're thinking about the future and they're thinking about things that may or may not come to fruition. And what that does is in the here and now, it makes it all scary. We see an example of this. And if if you've watched the classic uh, cartoon Snow White, Snow White finds herself running from the evil queen. And then in, the, in that moment when she, when she finds out that she's trying to have her killed and she starts, to, she starts to panic and she starts to run away, if you'll notice something in the movie, that all of the things that are around her, the trees and the grass and, and all of these things, all then become like these big scary monsters. All of a sudden there were logs and then they become alligators and all of these other things. And that's a picture perfect way of the way that we deal with things. Because we get so panicked about other things that all of a sudden we can't see past all of these things because they have become so scary and it's become and it's occupied our minds that we can't think straight patience is not only worrying it's not only waiting but patience is trusting 
Patience is not just us sitting here and twiddling our thumbs until God comes back, but it's trusting that no matter what happens, He is still in control. That's what patience is. And what James is saying to these people is even though you've been taken from your homes and even though you could possibly be thrown into prison and possibly be executed for your faith, patience is not just setting still, but it's trusting that God is sovereign and He will carry out His perfect will. And if patience is trusting then worrying is not trusting. James has alluded earlier to not rest in the future of the world in general, but now he shows us where we can place our trust. When we're patient, we trust in the Lord and prepare our hearts for His return. And then we naturally carry out the next verse. If we were to exercise patience, we're trusting the Lord, then naturally we get to verse 9. It says, do not grumble against one another, brothers. Grumbling against someone is not a legitimate way to carry out a complaint or a disagreement. Have you ever been around somebody that grumbles? Have you ever been somebody that grumbles? We all know what he's talking about here. We're not talking about somebody legitimately coming to you face to face and saying, hey, I've got some concerns. This is, this is what my concern is. I feel like we need to get past this and we need to resolve it. No, grumbling is more of the talking under your breath, folding your arms. Teenagers are really good at this. They grumble. Or you, you just... Sit there and you look at people and you think of, oh man, I'm just, I'm, I, we're really going to have a time talking about this later when they're not here. Grumbling is that person that sits back, you fold your arms, you roll your eyes. Oh, I can't, I can't believe that they did it this way and I, I would have done it so much different. Do not grumble against one another, brothers. What is he saying? If you've got time to focus on stupid things, you've got too much time. Be busy about the imminent coming of God. We, it's, it's a crazy thing because we believe we say that we believe that Christ could come back at any time, but then we yet we grumble and fight about the dumbest things. It's not the main thing. In fact, there was a survey where these uh, people traveled around and they, they did a survey of the top ten complaints of churchgoers in America. Put an emphasis on in America. The top ten complaints, here they are. Number one, I can't hear what's being said. I don't know that that's an issue here. <laughs> Number two, they slur their words and mumble. Number three, the organ drowns everything out. Number four, it's either too hot or too cold inside the church. Number five, nobody speaks to visitors. That one kills me because it's just like, then you go talk to them. That's what grumbling is, is we expect. We get so mad when people don't carry out something, but then all we do is grumble about it and we don't do anything to fix it. Number six, oh boy, the sermon is too long. Number seven, parents won't quiet their screaming children. Those are usually the folks that do not have children anywhere in or about their lives. Oh, I wish they would just quit. But then every single, and and this is the funny thing though, because every single congregation, they always say, we want young families until what happens? You get young families. And guess what happens? What comes with young families? Screaming kids. Every single time. Number eight, everybody sits toward the back of the church. But that's a, that's a complaint that people have. Why do you care who sits where? Yeah, exactly. 
Number nine, I can't follow along with all the hymnals and the worship folders. And number ten, the church is always asking for money. Then the article goes on to give different ideas as to what we can do to make sure that everyone's needs and expectations are being met during every church service to the point now that there are many churches that they'll have eight different weekend services just to make sure that they appeal to every single individual's needs. News flash. This is not about us and fulfilling our needs. This is about a certain time that we have set apart, that we've come to worship a holy God, and that we get to fellowship with one another, and we get to hear His Word, and we get to pour out the things that should be going on in our lives every single day. I tend to agree with the meme that I saw where these folks came to the pastor and they said, Pastor, I didn't really like the worship service this morning. He said, well, that's okay because it wasn't for you. And while, these, while some of these things may be legitimate concerns, and yes, we want you to be comfortable, and we want you to be able to, uh, to hear, and we, we don't want to just stay here all day for the sake of staying here all day, but the fact of the matter is, all of these things are dumb when it comes in the light of eternity. Notice that these were complaints of churchgoers in America. You know why? Because in some of these places where they're fearful for their lives, they don't have time to complain about the building being too hot or too cold because most of them aren't even able to meet in a building. Why doesn't prosperity gospel work? Is because in affluent, westernized America is the only place that that fits. We want to be comfortable and we want this to be a good time and we want, to, uh, we want to be together, but meeting our needs is not the main thing that should take place here. Worshiping God, reaching out to hurting people, showing them what God can do about the place that they're at. And here's the thing, if we want to really be true about bringing the gospel message to people that most need it, it can get real uncomfortable. Because they're not always going to dress the, same, the way that we think that they ought to dress. They're not always going to speak the way that we think they ought to speak. They're not always going to smell the way that we think that they ought to smell. But here's the thing. God can save anyone. And if we really want to live by the fact that we want to... What does our sign say? It says, what? Simple church? Simple truth? It, it, we keep it real simple that if you need saving, God can save you. doesn't matter how you smell. We hope eventually that will catch on. We'll get you some soap. It doesn't matter how you dress. I'm not concerned with your necessarily your lifestyle because I just believe if I introduce you to the Holy Spirit, He's going to take care of you and He's going to do what He promises to do and make you a new creation. That's not my job. My job is not to fix you up in the way that I think a Christian should look. That's his job. Do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. I don't know when, but I know that here at some point, and I would say sooner rather than later, this whole thing's going to wrap up. Maybe years and years and years, but I can tell you we're closer today than we were yesterday. The judge is at the door waiting to step onto the world stage. Now, I've used the example of Revelation chapter 3, verse, verse 20 to let people know that Jesus is waiting at the door of their hearts and He's wanting, to, wanting them to invite Him in. And while that is true, if we actually look at the context of that verse, 
He's speaking to a church. He's speaking to the church in Laodicea. And in the context, he's talking to this church. He's talking to a lukewarm church that has placed their trust in the same things that the world has placed their trust in. And he's saying, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if he is at the door knocking, it's because nobody's let him in. And my fear is not that God would require something of us or God would challenge us or that God would, God would want us to give more. My fear is that He would be outside knocking because we never let Him in. We need to focus on Him and not the trivial things. And we need to let Him in because He says, and this is what He says to the church in Laodicea, He says, if anyone hears my voice, we don't have to be perfect. You don't need to fix everybody around you. But if you hear his voice, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. And how many of you know that none of the other stuff matters if we're sitting down eating with Christ? If Christ were to come in today and he wanted to sit down and have a meal with us, we wouldn't be worried about next year or tomorrow or even this afternoon. We wouldn't be worrying about the decorations or the carpet color or the temperature of the room. We would just be in awe of the fact of his presence and finding out what he wants us to do. So if we want to do help struggling people, because we're struggling ourselves. If we want to be about simple truth and simple church, we've got none of the frills. All we've got is an introduction to who can change your life and accept you into his kingdom. That's it. That's all we got. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, we love you. God, we're thankful that the gospel is simple because I, for one, could not get it if it was complicated. We thank you for our church family, Father. We thank you for a place that we have to come to worship you. And we pray for our pastor, Father, that in the next service, as he's shared the message that you've placed on his heart, Father, we pray, God, that we would receive it. But we pray, God, that we would apply it to our lives. And we pray just now, Father, that if there's one that's listening, either online or here in person or in the next service, Father, that doesn't know you, Father, that's the main thing. And Father, help us be a place that would be welcoming to those that are hurting, to those that need you, Father. We pray, God, that we would be faithful in sharing your gospel message, Father, because you didn't leave us to ourselves. You rescued us from ourselves, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you. You're dismissed.